Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls everywhere, you saw me and Knox make potential errors in our very first set. But no more because we have the King of Kings, the <laughs> Legend of Legends, Louise Scott Vargas, to join us and talk about Zendikar Rising, standard drafts, and all sorts of other goodies. Louise, first of all, thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing this fine Wednesday? Uh, I'm doing excellent. I'm coming off of a, a you know Mythic Invitational Top Eight. Oh, always fun. Uh, yeah. Got to chat with you all weekend there. Since Dana only interviews winners, you know That's it. That's he's it. not he's not there for for, for <laughs> anyone else. So so that that was awesome. I, it, it always feels good to do well in a tournament. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, and I will say, uh, loser interviews are something that some events I've worked on in the past have included, and that's always quite stressful when you go, well, you lost. <laughs> and you just hold the microphone to them, and you just let this moment pass. But with you and me, Louise, every time I saw you, it was on the up and up. Yeah. You were uh, top six in the end, top six. Yes, that's good shit. Yeah, I think I finished sixth or seventh, whatever whatever it ends up being. Yeah. I, I don't know how the tiebreakers end up working. But no, fifth or sixth. You're right, you're right. I think yeah. I got actual six. So there well, we go. Look at that. Easy. Easiest game of your life. We're going to take that sort of <laughs> mental prowess with us. And we're going to be doing some analysis of the following. We're going to look at the top cards leaving Standard. Then we're going to look at the top cards coming into Standard. Then we're going to play two decks that Luis sent to us in Standard. And then Luis is going to help me do a draft because I'm a little bit subpar edit. And afterwards, I will get fifth or sixth in every draft I do from here on out. That's what I fully expect <laughs> to happen. But I wanted to ask before we do all of that, what are your initial thoughts on Zendikar Rising? Things you're excited about? One of the things that I, I'm most excited about is all the different lands, the double-faced lands, spells, hybrid cards, where you can play them as a land or as a spell, because especially for limited, they're going to be just incredible at making making it you get to play 20 lands in your deck, but also not run out of spells. Yeah. And then even for constructed, there's just a lot of cool things, like ways to pick up your lands means that like later in the game, you can pick one up that you had to play as a land. And I don't know, there's oh, yeah. a lot of cool gameplay with that. And I actually wanted to ask about what are your thoughts on some numbers, right? So let's say that we're sort of a controllier deck and we're running 26 lands, an even number to make the math easier. Um, one approach to trying to put in some of these modal lands would be something like, okay, I have eight forests. I'll cut four of those forests and replace them with four modals. So I still have 26 land total, but four of them are modals. There's also the argument of, no, 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 go to 30 land total with like eight modals. So that way you have guaranteed consistency. Like what, what are some of the numbers you think would make sense as an initial starting point for us nerds trying to experiment? I think in general, you want to err on the side of just playing more lands than you normally would, because these are the, the strength of these cards is that you can play them as lands if you need to, but you kind of don't want to because later in the game, they're just better than excess lands. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a little like cycling lands where if you have a lot of lands that kind of convert themselves into something else, you're incentivized to play more lands rather than fewer. So I'd look to play 26, yeah. 28, 30 lands instead of 24, 25 lands when you've got some good modo cards that kind of fit into what your deck's trying to do. Now, I got, I got my ass kicked because I learned that, for instance, with Arboreal Grazer, which, as we all found out from Monty, <laughs> is no longer standard legal, um, it says you may put a land from your hand onto the battlefield. But if you have a dual face card that's like a sorcery on the front and a land on the back, you can't play it with the Arboreal Grazer. Because yeah, technically these the, do have a front and back side. Yeah, because only the front is relevant. So I don't know how this interacts fully with all the rest of the things, like you may play an additional land. I think you may play an additional land is okay, but if it's you may put a land from your hand onto the battlefield, that's when you're that's when you're in pain? Yeah, that that's exactly right. And and likewise, if your opponent casts something like Thoughtseize, they could take one of these cards out of your hand if the front side is a spell, which is how they work. <laughs> That's going to be terrific for mulliganing decisions. All right, so we're going oh, yeah. to get more in-depth to these modal lands, all sorts of good juicy stuff coming in Zendikar Rising, but let's talk about what's leaving Standard, because as far as I'm concerned, the best part of the year ever in Magic is when all the cards pull out, because it's like this mass resetting of things. So... Um, we have this list of six cards that you picked, and I'm wondering if you just start going through some of these. Why are these some of the big notable ones to, to look at? Uh, so, yeah, the, these are cards that not only represent the card itself, but also the, you know, the, the other cards in the cycle are in that category. And I think the biggest one actually we should start with is Steam Vents. Uh, the whole cycle of Shocklands... Steam Vents, Hallowed Fountain, Breeding yeah. Pool, et cetera, all, all, all 10, they're, they're leaving. So the mana bases and standards is just really going to change a lot. You have the the you know the, the pathways in 
in Zendikar to Skyways, or uh, it, where you get to play them as either uh, white land on the front side or red land on the back side. And those are good duels. They are a little less powerful than something like Sacred Foundry, though, because that, while in play, adds red or white, whereas these, you have to choose when you play it. You lock it in. Yeah. You, is this going to be a plains or is this going to be a mountain? And it's just that forever. But, you know, the, the, these duels rotating is really going to have a big impact on kind of the, the composition of decks where, yeah, maybe you're not going to get away with playing Casualties of War and double blue cards in your Sultai deck anymore. <laughs> That's just not something you can do. But I think the mana is still going to be pretty good. Yeah, because, I mean, and I want to I stress to everyone, Steam Vents is just the one that we happen to put up. It's not that Steam Vents specifically matters, because I, I immediately saw someone in chat go, but what about what about Breeding Pool? Yes, <laughs> because of Earl and Simic being super OP. But, yeah, I mean, when you would make a three-color deck in former standard, you would just jam in the 12 overlapping dual lands, and then some Fabled Passages, and then worry about it less. Um Talk to me a little bit about Light Up the Stage and Runaway Steamkin. Oh, yeah. I mean, we haven't seen... And again, these, yeah. these kind of represent a whole suite of cards. Uh, you know, actually, a Scorch Spitter is a big one. It's actually seeing more play than Steamkin these days. But these are kind of all uh, these good mono-red aggressive cards that, you know, like we're still... We still have got Embercleave. We still have Anax. We still have some, some really powerful cards right. for mono-red. But it's losing this big core that w existed in Ravnica, the whole Ravnica sets... Where, which really drove a lot of mono red over the past year. So I, I, it's going to be interesting to see kind of where the red decks adapt. And of course, Zendikar is going to bring new new cool tools for red, but the mono red decks that we're kind of used to are, are going to look different. And, you know, we have Hydroid Krasis and Nissa, who I feel like were kind of, they were kind of just a match made in heaven, where you'd have these Simic decks where you'd descend <laughs> down to one card in hand, and it would be a Krasis, and then you'd expand back to eight cards in hand, and of course there's the uncounterability aspect of the Hydroid Krasis, that no matter what, you still draw the card, you still gain the life, even if the spell is countered. <laughs> I mean, how do you think green, in particular Simic, are going to wind up shifting as a result? I really don't think there's going to be a lot of tears shed for, for Simic losing all of its toys. <laughs> I, I mean, Uro's still around. We already lost Grow Spiral. You know, we, we I think that people have lost a lot of matches to Breeding Pool, and it, I, yeah. I, for one, am looking forward to, to kind of getting a, a new refresher. That's the whole that's the whole exciting thing when a, a new set comes in. It's, again, not just the new cards you get to play with, but it also opens up deck-building possibilities when, you know, Nissa and, and Hydro Crisis kind of ruled the roost for so long that it's cool seeing new, new new cards get a chance to shine, even cards from sets that were yeah. already in standard that now have a little more room to breathe. It also felt like in the past few months, Blue in particular with the sort of, you know, historically speaking, Blue control decks with a good amount of counter spells. These just seem to be increasingly using Blue for cards like Aether Gust, not for cards like counter spells, even just not having Blue as the main color, just a splash for the, you know, sort of Simic variants. Do you think that the blue sort of counterspell stuff is going to get a big boost as a result of these rotations out? Well, lo losing Ether Gust is is a pretty big deal. I, that's actually a card that I'm I'm not sad to see leaving either. Ether Gust has been such an endemic main deck card that I, you know, which I don't think was actually intended necessarily. Yeah. And and it's just like okay, well, it it's time to it's time for people to be a little bit uh have to have to do a little more work to to get an effective counter slash removal hybrid. Blue has some some pretty strong counter spells in, in the new set, and I'm kind of curious to see how those play out. I actually really like Jawari Disruption, the two mana four spike slash sensor card oh, yeah, that you can the, play as a tap. A the tap sensor land, land. Yep. sensor land. I don't yeah. know what the name of it is. I will forget it immediately. It's sensor <laughs> land, man. Sensor land is rad. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to play with that one. Now, uh, I did want to ask about Vivian Arcbow Ranger, which uh, is kind of interesting because this is a card that is not regularly making lists for, oh, this needs to be banned, get this out of there. You know, the mono green lists have shown up. This very much so needs to be in a green, or at least very base, or at the very yeah, least a triple green, green right? <laughs> yeah, triple green is, it's a very, very green card. Why this one do you think is a significant one to be pointing to as rotating out? So, so Vivian was kind of actually like a, a, a late bloomer. And when it comes to cards, she didn't really get a whole lot of press initially. But she, first of all, she, she's been awesome in Pioneer. So I, I've actually been really impressed. There's a, the, the um, mono green, all Planeswalker <coughs> deck in Pioneer really utilizes her well. Yeah. And then the, the, the mono green aggro deck in Standard, what Vivian does is offers green this like really efficient removal spell slash threat hybrid. Yeah. So... Uh, just seeing the effect Vivian has, 
I actually am going to miss Vivian. I think she adds a lot to gameplay, but yeah. wow, she's she's just such a beating of a card. When you when you play Vivian, use your you know questing beast to kill their gigantic thing, and then next turn put two plus plus one counters on it. Like that's just so hard to beat. Now there is some cards here that we don't have, like Narset, <laughs> or like all these oh, not passive miss planes. That <laughs> oh my god, the number of times I have carefully thought through a play. And then cast a card draw spell only to hear that. I mean, that's that's gonna <laughs> haunt me. That sound effect. I mean, um, a, a lot of the planeswalker passives are now out. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on Narset leaving? What does this open up? I, I think that Narset and you know T Teferi, while Teferi was around, like these these are cards that generally were they they had a they had a higher frustration quotient than I would like to see when playing against them. Yeah. It, and, you know, Narset kind of fell out of favor to recently, but I think that Narset was always lurking there. And what Narset did is say, hey, if you're playing a control deck and you can't efficiently kill Planeswalkers, you're just going to lose a lot of games to Narset. And, yeah, maybe that keeps people a little honest, but on the other hand, I, I, I'm i looking forward to not having to, to, like you said, make plays and then find out those plays are really, really bad because yeah. of the card that's on the other side of the board. Yeah, no, I'm sort of used to cards that allow me to do more as opposed to cards that are preventing me from doing much. You know, just give me a, just give me a discard. I'm happy to get thought seized. Yeah. That's fine. So now we're going to transition away from what's rotating out to what's coming in. And uh, LSV helped procure this list, this top 10, uh, in no particular order, but 10 significant cards coming to standard, starting with Nissa of shadowed bows so let's read this puppy out loud this is a four loyalty planeswalker two black green whenever land enters the battlefield you can put a loyalty counter on nissa you can plus to temporarily get a three three elemental <laughs> land okay you can temporarily get it it does have menace and haste which is nice i think too because i did i did kind of like that aspect of um prior nissa that she was a threat to planeswalkers you could play pick off a planeswalker and be done this still has that but it's not the endless accumulation of it. But the juicy one is the minus five. You can search your hand or graveyard for a creature and just slam it on the battlefield with a pair of counters. Talk to me about your joys of reading Nissa. <laughs> well, N N Nissa throws some bows. I mean, N Nissa comes in and really pressures opposing planeswalkers. I think that's like that you, you you picked up on that. That's the strongest part, especially with menace. Like you're going to end up. Having, you know, you've got your five loyalty planeswalker in play, you've got a 2 2, they've got a, like, a pair of 2 2s, and they're like, Nissa, make a land into a menace 3 3, kill your planeswalker. And, uh, like, even yeah. your cat likes it. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah, no, you, know? you can hear that. No, she really <laughs> wants to come in. Listen, when we're in the break, the doors are swinging open, and that little baby girl's going to come on in. I don't care at all. I will shamelessly promote my cats <laughs> at every opportunity. But yes, please go on while Sheriff Meows desperately at the <laughs> yeah, door. So well, one of the cool things about Nissa is that uh, Nissa is temporary, the animation part, and I actually think this card would have been nuts without that. So <laughs> yeah. it really it really pushes Nissa more in an aggressive uh, deck than it would in a control deck because Nissa doesn't protect herself because that land is, you know no longer is animated on the opponent's turn, yeah. and you really want to be the the person with the initiative when you're when you're playing Nissa. Uh, she also pays you off pretty heavily with the minus five for having a bunch of just solid creatures you want to bring back. So I could definitely see this being a deck that uh, kind of like a green black mid range deck, a lot of creatures, yeah, you're, yeah. you're somewhat aggress aggressive, your opponent's going to be on the back foot so they can't attack Nissa all that well. And the, the landfall getting extra loyalty means that if you've got ways to put extra lands into play, Nissa can, her loyalty can skyrocket quickly. Do you view that, I mean, anytime someone sees reanimation, there's immediately the thought of, oh, how do I make an absolute reanimation focused list? We haven't really seen reanimation decks be any better than like tier two, tier three in standard. You were talking about the mid range yeah. aspects of this where it will obviously excel, but what about just some real juicy reanimation focused nonsense? Uh, I think that oh, one of the one of the the things that Nissa does is. Uh, she says when you have a number of lands, it, you can only bring back creatures that are cost less than an equal number of lands you control. Mm -hmm. So that gets around the like total cheating aspect where you're like, oh, yeah. I'm gonna use Nissa to, to get to get my eight drop into play on turn five. <laughs> yeah. it, this is more of a this is more of a value card. You're gonna end up using Nissa to kind of bring back your four or five drop that provides value when it enters the battlefield, that sort of thing. Love it. Let's go on to card number nine that is not numbered, but is still in no particular order. <laughs> Lotus Cobra. 
Now, this card is a reprint. Can you just tell what's, what's the history of Lotus Cobra, man? What, what, what's what's some of the real juicy stuff that has occurred with this card? In the well, so, so Lotus Cobra was in original Zendikar, and uh, it was a mythic rare, which that, that was a, a minor kerfuffle at the time, you know, because <laughs> they're like, oh, why is this mythic? It's not a staple card. I actually, I, I like that it's rare. It feels rare to me. But... You know, Lotus Cobra did a lot of work because of the, the fetch lands, you know, Arid Mesas and, uh, of the world that were in the set uh, with it. It's going to be a little dialed back here because you've only got Fabled Passage yeah. to really, really pop off like that. But Lotus Cobra is still a really strong card because even just like playing it fairly, playing one land a turn, Lotus Cobra is still a two mana, two one that adds a mana of any color and can still attack on that yeah. same turn. Do you think it's... So, is it better suited for an aggressive deck as a result of that? Like just a mono green stompy type structure? Yeah, it doesn't have to be necessarily mono green because Lotus Cobra fixes, you know, sure, all, all sure. the colors. But but you, you would want this more in a deck that values having a 2-1 in play, which is not going to be... Like like Sultai Control, for example, is not going to want Lotus Cobra as much as something like Cultivate because it doesn't want a card that gets killed by creature removal where the deck has no creatures in it. It gets killed by its own sweepers, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, with all the insane landfall potentialities, is there any is there any sort of mixture you're eager to try out with Lotus Cobra? I mean, I know, I, think, I know. You're a fan of the Felidar Retreat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Felidar Retreat's really cool. Uh, I, 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 Azusa Lost But Seeking and Lotus Cobra could pair up nicely. I'm not sure if that's going to end up working out, but Azusa's a really strong card that, yeah. as as of yet, hasn't seen any standard play. Yeah, and absolutely has seen play in older formats and is incredibly oh, yeah. fun to play. So, Moving on past Lotus Cobra, we now have Shatter Skull Smashing X and Double Red. Before I even say what the card is, you can flip it and play it <coughs> not just as a red source, but there is a cycle of five lands that you can have enter the battlefield untapped if you pay three life, which is a hell of a lot of life to pay to get it untapped, but it's still always good to have untapped land sources. So Shatter Skull Smashing deals X damage. Divide as you choose among up to two target creatures and or planeswalkers, kind of like a baby sweeper. X is six or more, it's twice X damage. Now, with a lot of these kinds of uh, you know modal cards, if this were just a sorcery on the front, how would you evaluate this as just a good old-fashioned sorcery? It, it, it wouldn't be a card, I, I think, that you would put in most decks, almost any deck, just yeah. because you, what you're looking at is you're paying probably four or five mana to kill two small creatures or a small creature and a Planeswalker on low loyalty, and then like six or seven mana to kill two big creatures. And that's fine. That's a card I'm obviously going to first pick and draft, but yeah. in, in Constructed, you just can't you can't put cards that are that inefficient in your deck without a, a really good reason to. This one has a good reason to, which is yeah. it, it's effectively a, a mountain that's either a little painful or comes into play tapped, both of which are, are are things that you can deal with. And the fact that you have the option of both means sometimes you'll play this on turn one you ha when you have no one drop and it won't really cost you anything. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you'll just, you'll just pay the life, you, especially if you're an aggressive, uh, you know, a, a, an aggressive deck that doesn't care about its life total, it's not a really big cost to play a couple of Shatter Skull Smashings, especially since those are the decks that don't really need their 6th or 7th land, but also would love to get to play 24 lands instead of 20 lands and, and not get mana screwed as often. And I was asking you a little bit about some of the numbers, how you might think of incorporating, well, you should err on the side of having, say, 30 land if you're including some of these modal lands, but... When you're actually going through the process of saying, okay, I have a lot of mountains that I want to replace with some number of Shatter Skull Smashings, are you thinking in like two or three color decks, including four of these, or is this like a one or two of? How are you sort of evaluating putting mixtures of these modal lands into the main into the main deck? So, so one of the one of the things you really have to keep in mind is the 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 set uh, the cycle of castles from Throne of Eldraine. You know, Castle Ardenvale, Castle Embreath, yeah. also really strong lands. They enter the battlefield tapped if you don't have a basic land of their or a land type of their of their color. Yeah. Shatter Skull Smashing and Shatter Skull Pass don't count as that. So imagine a mono red deck that's like, oh, I'm just gonna play four Shatter Skull Smashing, four Castle Embereth, and you know, fifteen mountains. I'm it's my twenty three, you know, land deck. If you draw if you draw Shatter Skull Smashing and two Castle Embreaths, all of a sudden all your lands oh, come to play tapped. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and that's that's just a really big cost. So you gotta balance that. You got to balance how many actual basic lands you need if you're like a three color deck, for example. I would imagine you want to play Fable Passage in your deck, 
Well, that means you have to have at least two of each basic most in most decks, maybe two, two, one. And then the, these cards kind of cut into that. My inclination with a card like this is to probably play a couple copies and then play like, almost like, I almost feel like you would, if you played two extra copies of this, you could play like an extra land. And if you played three extra copies, maybe two extra lands, like not a complete one for one, but yeah, you also yeah. don't want to end up with too many inefficient cards in your deck. And this card is a little inefficient. Yeah, that's, that's the thing that I'm most eager to, you know, feel out because this is a, a really kind of new evaluation process in my brain. I don't even know what the right, no, like, I don't have a feel for it. Like when you're building a deck and you're like, this does feel like a 28 lander. Like I, 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 all that is thrown out the window for me when it comes to evaluating these. So when Yeah, we well, that, that's why you got to have a Frank Karsten on dial, dial up to, to, yes. to figure out your, <laughs> your, your mana base. <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely am one of those people that when I type FR or my Google's like, oh, you want Frank Karsten mana. Let's go ahead and here it is. All the pages <laughs> yeah, yeah. are purple in the search bar. I'm like, oh yeah, no, I visit this regularly. Uh, the next card. Oh, is... Actually, Ch Chat just pointed out that Frank Frank himself said these count as two thirds of a land. So there we go. When I, when I said you want to add three and, and go two of extra land, oh something gosh, like that. That's <laughs> perfect. That's amazing. No, I, I I love when you have someone who is providing technical knowledge to an audience that wants technical knowledge. But then if you're talking yes. to someone who's like beginner or intermediate, and they're like. What the fuck is two thirds of a land? <laughs> like, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean anything. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, no, those games where they're like, well, you know, this this move is in a sense a half point move. I'm like, you score points one at a time in this game. You're breaking my mind. Yeah, but yeah. Well, when you have a game that has probabilities associated, those sort of little uh, you know heuristics are super nice. Now, this next oh, yeah. card, Royal Eruption, one in a red that deals three damage to any target. It's sorcery speed, and you can kick it for five more for a total of seven mana to deal five damage instead. Now. This is the sort of card that I feel like is easy to look at at first glance and go, it's bad lightning bolt. Or it's lava coil that doesn't deal as much damage. When is red ever going to get to pay seven? Why would I want to pay seven to deal five damage? I mean, what's your reaction to all this, given that this card actually <laughs> looks kind of insane? Yeah, so it's the same kind of thing that people said about Burst Lightning, which was an original Zendikar, which was one mana for two damage, and you pay four kicker to get an additional two. If the, the, the front side, if the front half of the card is good, which two two mana for three damage is, then paying an additional five to get an additional two damage is just upside. You yeah. Don't look at it as, how is my mono red deck going to get to seven mana? And the answer is, yeah. it's mostly not. But you would also play a sorcery speed deal three in a lot of cases. Not every case, but a lot of cases. And then sometimes you have a lot of mana and this just kills the opponent. It It's really important to kind of look at the like, opportunity cost and... You're not adding a seven mana card to your deck. You're adding a good two mana card to your deck that has the yeah. additional uh, opportunity to, to do that without really costing you anything. And it's also, okay, I'm gonna make a statement that I know is true and then I'm gonna make a statement that I have no idea if it's true at all. But the first <laughs> statement Go is that, you know, if you looked at standard before rotation, there were a lot of three damage spells that only targeted creatures. Things like Lava Coil, um, Scorching Dragon Fire, um, I mean, even like older ones, Shiv and Fire, like being able to just kick up to just blast a creature out of the way, really nice. But I actually don't know post rotation how many of these direct damage to face spells there even are. I mean, it kind of felt like when you were looking at building your suite of red damage spells, you had huge variety right before rotation. Do you have a sense of like how many of those really potent two mana uh, burn spells are leaving standard? So one of the cool things you get to do uh, when you're designing cards, which is wizards, you know, one of their main jobs, uh, is <laughs> you, you get to kind of have ebb and flow where in some formats, there's three good burn spells in standard that all go to the face. And what that means is when you play a game against a mono red deck and you're at 11 life, you don't feel that good, right? Because you're like, well, I know they, they've got a bunch of deal fours and deal <laughs> yeah. threes. But then the, 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 the kind of the pendulum swings to the other side and it's like, hey, we've got a bunch of really efficient removal spells like you said scorching dragon fire lava coil sheaven fire you know when it was here but they don't go to the face and that feels very differently because now you're like oh i'm gonna go to seven against this red deck and i know they can't burn me out very easily yeah royal eruption kind of tilts the balance back towards the first part part of the reason i like this card is that it goes to the face you can hit them for three you can hit them for five in the late game there's just going to be some games finished when your opponent you know you attack them down to 10 and you go kick royal eruption go and they're like yeah. Wow, I'm at five. I, I, I know there's another one coming. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And 
And I think it's just really good for the texture of games when sometimes you've got a year where you don't get burned out very often and you have to right. play around something like Ember Cleave instead. It's combat based. And then sometimes, yeah, burn spells matter a lot and you have to make plays to protect your life total because they've got a lot of direct damage. I, I think it's just a really cool aspect and I think we're moving more towards kind of the latter world in, in this case. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, as odd as it sounds, I so badly want just a to-the-face mono-red deck back in standard because those are some of the most fun, tense matchups. So our next card is... Well, it, it, I'd, I'd rate it a Tarmogoyf out of five. It's the Nighthawk Scavenger, <laughs> one in a pair of blacks for a Vampire Rogue. Now, before we even read any more of the card, Rogues have a ton of support and synergy and things that give benefits and boosts to other Rogues whenever a Rogue attacks Mill and so on and so forth. So that's already relevant. But it has Flying, Death Touch, Lifelink, a lot of good keywords, and its power is equal to one plus the number of card types among cards in your opponent's graveyards. And there's seven card types. There's not eight. Tribal is not a card type. <laughs> Don't you dare bring that into this chat. But yeah. <laughs> uh, card type is like instant sorcery, creature, planeswalker, artifact, enchantment, and uh, I forgot where I was in the list, but there's land. L L land. Like, oh, yeah. whew. But and, and l l land matters. Fabled Passage. You know, that yeah. that's, that's going to be one of the more common lands that ends up in the graveyard here. I, I really like Nighthawk Scavenger because... If this is a three mana three three flying death touch lifelink consistently, I think it's it's pretty sweet. And if it's uh, bigger than that, it's going to be incredible. And it's just not that hard. I mean, just think of a normal game of Magic that you know nothing nothing strange is going on. On turn five, how many cards are in your opponent's graveyard? Probably two or three, right? Maybe more. Yeah. That, that just means this is already going to have probably two to two to three different card types. And if you do a little bit of work with like a discard spell or a removal spell. All of a sudden, this is just like a 4-3, I mean, and that that's just such a good rate. And so I want to ask about two different deck archetypes. One is going to be like Demir Flash Rogue or just Demir Rogue style, something that's really emphasizing the rogueliness, which um, if any of you have looked through the spoiler sets, you'll see that there's a whole ton of cards that just, when this rogue attacks, put two creatures into the graveyard. This would obviously be a fitting piece in the rogue deck if it was good, but if the rogue deck isn't good, obviously Nighthawk Scavenger is not going to be participating in that kind of deck. What do you think about the rogue archetype and this fitting into it first? Well, I, I hope rogues are good because that's one of the decks that we're aiming to play today. <laughs> oh, listen, uh, I, yes. I copy-pasted and then I immediately <laughs> called you. I have no idea what we're playing. That's cool to hear. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say that it's good. Uh, we'll talk more about the deck when we get there, but it was brewed up by uh, Patrick Chapin, who, of course, is, is, is fantastic at this yeah. sort of thing. Uh, the, the way I see the rogue type line on this card is just strict upside sometimes you'll care about that there's there's a bunch of cards that care about starting a party right you know yeah. your your rogue wizard cleric warrior sort of deal um but even but even without the rogue if this was just creature type nothing i would like this card a lot i think it's just an, a powerful card on its own a text box merit so it's just nice having that additional value maybe it'll put it over the line right a little little tiebreaker yeah. there and, you know, the second question I was going to ask is, do you see this more fitting in as kind of like an alternate Thief of Sanity, you know, where you'd be a, a, a like an Esper or Demir control deck and you just play a Nighthawk Scavenger as a really substantial threat? Do you think that's more of a suitable role for it? Well, I, I really love in uh, one of the one of the things that I think best of three really does best is you could be playing this like Esper creatureless deck in game one and then you have four Nighthawk Scavengers in your sideboard yeah. and you board them in if your opponent doesn't kill this, this does run away with the game. If you're hitting for three or four lifelink damage a turn, it's hard to lose. But your opponent also probably took out a bunch of removal spells because your deck didn't have any creatures. Yeah, and yeah. even if you go to game three and they're like, oh, I know they have Nighthawk Scavengers, first of all, you can board them out and juke them again. Yeah. Second, if they board in a bunch of removal and you don't draw Scavenger, it's really bad for them. But if they don't draw removal and you do draw Scavenger, it's great for you. And if you both, if you draw removal, or if they draw removal and you draw scavenger, you traded one for one. You didn't really lose that much. So I really do like that idea of having this kind of fill that thief of sanity role, though being better against aggro decks in general. Our next card that we're going to be peeking at is Blood Chief's Thirst, a single black sorcery that says destroy target creature or planeswalker with converted mana cost two or less, or you can kick it for a bonus three, making it two black, two colorless. The spell is kicked, just destroy the creature or the planeswalker instead. Anything that is one mana conditional removal feels good. Yeah. 
Yeah, I saw I saw plenty of people on Twitter saying this was you know maybe the best black removal in standard that uh, there there ever has been printed. So uh, wow, really? Well, mostly mostly I said that, and it was it was to be a little <laughs> inflammatory. <laughs> but, but you know, uh, some people are saying this. I don't know who, <laughs> but tweet at those people and follow and subscribe to their content. Of course, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, I do think Blood Chief Thirst is excellent, and the reason I'm really high on this card is. Against slow decks, it's a four mana removal spell, and that's fine. It's not good, but it's it's playable. It it, it does something, you know. Vraska's contempt and eat to extinction all, you know, those those saw some play. Yeah. Where it really shines those against a fast deck, maybe one of the mono red decks we were talking about, a one mana removal spell that kills a one or a two drop is really really good. It's going to be one of the best cards in your deck against these low curve decks. Yeah. So having a card that's an A plus against aggro and still like a C against you know your your slower decks. That's just a good card. I really am impressed with Blood Chief's Thirst. Are you imagining it as a four of in the main or like a two of in the main with two in the side or something like this? It's mostly going to depend on how many fast decks there are. If there's a lot of fast decks, I'm just going to play four of this card. If there are not very many fast decks, then this is a sideboard card more than a main deck card. Yeah, I mean, there's not too terrifically much to talk about other than please keep your eye on cards like this that look kind of innocuous, but in terms of just sheer value are just so nice. Well, I also, I mean, you know, looking past standard, uh, this is a card that I think could be really good in older formats too, especially ones that have things like Red and Six, a two mana Planeswalker, yeah, you know, Tarmogoyf, yeah. Death Shadow. The, the, this is an efficient removal spell, and it's pretty, it's unconditional when you need it to be. So the next card is one that when I first looked at, it, it, it took me a minute to feel like it was good at all, and it felt it just kept feeling better and better the more I looked at it, but I would love your evaluation of Acquisitions Expert, one in a black for a 1-2 when it enters the battlefield. Target opponent reveals a number of cards from their hand equal to the number of creatures in your party. You choose one of those cards and they discard that. And my understanding is you just pick two at random. Or is the opponent actually choosing two cards to show to you? The, they, they get to choose what to show to you. So how it's going to work is, let's say you play this on turn two, they're just going to effectively show you their worst card. So you're, you're just going to be two mana, one, two. They, they choose and discard a card. Yeah, it's like Burglar Rat. Exactly. Later in the game, though, they're going to have hard choices. You play this with, let's say, uh, two members of the party now, and they have three cards. They have to show you two of those three cards, keeping their best one. Or later in the game, you play this, they have to show you three cards, and they have two cards in hand. Obviously, you could see their whole hand here. Yeah. Um, they can actually stop this if they have an instant speed removal spell. If you played this on turn two and they shocked it in response, they wouldn't have to discard anything because you'd have no no party members. Yeah. But this really pays you off for having other creature types. And by itself, a two mana one two burglar rats. First of all, burglar rats made top eight at one of the pro tours just recently. One of the, <laughs> the regional players tour. Oh yeah. The so so let's, off your let's, let's not forget. Exactly. Let's not forget that burglar rats saw a little bit of play. This is so much better. This is. Closer to Kite Sail Freebooter, actually. Uh -huh. It permanently discards the card, but of course you have less selection. Unless you're going really hard on the like Rogue, Wizard, Warrior, Cleric sort of deal, yeah. which there are a lot of cards that pay you off for that, so I wouldn't be surprised if this saw a good amount of play. Plus, Rogues look awesome, and this is a good two-mana Rogue. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I feel like it's also noteworthy that it is a human, which is a pretty notable creature type, because, I mean, there's just a lot of humans that wind up sort of showing up, overlapping all over the place. Yeah, I actually wouldn't be shocked if this was like a one or two of in some of the like modern humans decks against combo decks. Oh, where because yeah. I, I I haven't looked at the creature types. Got to imagine the humans decks have a bunch of random creature cleric warrior yeah, sort of deals yeah, yeah, yeah. floating around, right? Oh my <laughs> so, gosh! Yeah, yeah I, I like the card. This can hit lands too, by the way. If if you played this and they had three cards in hand and you had three party members. You could just take a land if, if like they needed land number five really badly or something. Oh, I never thought of that. Yeah, I mean, all the duresses and thought seizes and so on and so forth, all of them are always non-land, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, this is just a card, so you you really can. Yeah, and, and the reason properly. is it's, it's, it's pretty bad, right, to get your lands discarded. That's usually pretty not fun. This can't really hit lands until later in the game. Unless your opponent wants to show you lands, it's kind of up to them. So it's yeah, it's yeah. it's safe, but it's good to keep that in mind. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm so bad at keeping track of creature types, but I try to make myself do it ever since I had a game one, played Chandra, Awaken Inferno, minus three to deal three damage <laughs> to all creatures and discovered 
Nissa lands are elemental, discover yep. that the runaway Steamkin is an elemental, and many others. So I'm 100% certain of which cards are elementals or not, and maybe it's responsible to do so for humans and rogues and so on. <laughs> like... Um, Definitely. Next card is Seagate Stormcaller, one in a blue. For a 2-1, that when it enters the battlefield, you copy the next instant or sorcery spell with converted mana cost two or less. You cast this turn when you cast it. So it's very important to note this isn't like some of the other flash copiers where you play it and it copies the thing on the stack. You play this, and you can then go to your second main phase and then cast, and it'll copy the next one. If you kick it for an extra five, you can copy that spell twice instead. So this is, this was, I know this was pretty high up on your own list. Yeah, I, I think a lot, it's funny, people are so funny when it comes to new cards. They look at this, they're like, this is worse than Snapcaster, this sucks. And it's like, yeah, but the bar shouldn't be Snapcaster Mage. Snapcaster That's not Mage. a reasonable bar. <laughs> it's it's like you said earlier, right. It's like you said earlier when it's like, oh, is this a bad lightning bolt? It's like, well, everything's a bad lightning bolt. Lightning bolt's the best burn spell ever printed. So, yeah. What, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I actually really like Seagate Stormcaller. I think the card is fairly costed, and it has some really cool things. One thing to note is when you have a cheap spell with Kicker, if you cast this and then play a kicked cheap spell, like, say, an Into the Royal, it'll copy the kicked version. Oh, right. Yeah, so so you end up in a spot where for six mana, you can play this, then kick an Into the Royal, bounce two of their permanents, and draw two cards. Or if you really want, you could actually bounce this back to set up, like, future shenanigans. Yeah. And... With one or two mana removal spells, like, <clears throat> imagine on turn three, you play Seagate Stormcaller, and you play Blood Chief's Thirst and kill their two creatures. Wow, that card is, that was a really good card. And yeah. then when you top deck one of these later, and you can kick it and play something, you get a ton of value. So, I'm in for flexible, powerful cards that are good early and good late. This does require you to put a lot of cheap spells in your deck, but I think that's a cost that, that you're really, you know, willing to pay. Yeah, I mean, like the, the downside is you might need to have more card draw in the deck, which already seems... I mean, hell, even just being able to drop <laughs> this on turn two in a pinch is so yeah, nice. Yeah, it, it's, it's certainly good, and I, I'm excited to build around Seagate Stormcaller. I think there's there's a lot of potential here. And, and how would you build around it? Because, I mean, some of the examples you used were sort of incidental value, like I'm going to just remove two of the creatures, not necessarily use Seagate Stormcall to pull off some crazy game-winning combo, or do you still view it very Snapcaster Mage-like, where it's just so versatile, you just include it, include cheap stuff, and figure shit out? So, what, what you want to do is, you want to make sure, first of all, that you have, I'm going to say, like, at least, like, something like 12 to 16 cards that work with this, just so you have yeah. have one have access to one. The, the biggest downside to this compared to something like Snapcaster is you need to have both cards in hand. Snapcaster, you can draw on turn 10 and you used a, right. a lightning bolt on turn one, right? And it still works. This, you actually need to line it up. So you need to kind of play a, a, a good enough density. And then the other thing is you don't want to just have one note spells. Like, you know, Blood Chief's Thirst is a great card to copy but you don't really want to just have removal spells. You want to have cards that are good to copy against a deck without creatures as well. So I would look for a mix of good good spells that are you know good against a variety of decks, and then also cards that are good early and good late. And if you can, getting kicker cards into really is an effective combo. Like Into the Royal and this, I think, pair nicely. Yeah, in front of you who don't know Into the Royal, it's basically blink of an eye. You can pay a blue and one to bounce a thing, or you can pay an additional blue and one to also draw a card. And I feel like yeah. there was maybe some other condition attached to that, or maybe I'm just correct. No, no, it's not. It's not land. You can't bounce lands, but they, they don't do that anymore anyway. Uh, yeah. well, actually, Chad has a really good combo: village rights, the one mana, <clears throat> one mana oh, spell that you have to yeah. sack a creature. That that's just like a sick combo with this because you don't actually have to pay the the cost again. Ooh, you could actually just play this, then play village rights, sack and this, and draw four cards. I mean. Yeah, there, there's definitely some potential here. <laughs> oh, that has so many legs. That is so good. Oh, all right. Okay, Seagate Stormcaller. Hell yes. Moving on to, okay, this is my my absolute favorite card in this entire set. This is Felidar Retreat. Three and a white for a legal field of the dead. It's an enchantment. When a land enters the <laughs> battlefield, you summon not zombies, which are still great, but instead 2-2 two, two white cat beast creature tokens. And, as if it weren't good enough, you know what really stunk when you were doing Field of the Dead decks? Massacre Worms, LSV. Massacre Worms. Anything that dealt oh, yeah. to, not a chance is this going to remove you now. You can play all sorts of land. Even if you can get instant speed lands out in response, you can put plus one, plus one counters on each creature you control. They gain Vigilance until end of turn, but who cares if you're attacking nonstop? I mean, this seems, <laughs> this seems very strong 
because you can just get it out on turn four. You don't need any weird conditionality on the different land types that Field of the Dead needed. Yeah, this is also an enchantment. It's really hard to interact with. A lot of decks won't be able to kill this. And having each of your lands, the floor for each land is a 2-2 cat, and the ceiling is something like 6-6 six, six worth of stats or more. Because you're going to go make a yeah. cat, make a cat, make a cat, then plus and plus one, plus and plus one, plus and plus one. Oh, yeah. You know, as, as it continues. Imagine playing this and then playing a, a Fabled Passage, just getting two cats immediately. It, oh, it, yeah. It's funny because... Uh, Retreat to Ameria was a was a card that saw standard play. Retreat to Ameria is exactly this card, except instead of a 2-2, you get a 1-1. Instead of a plus plus one counter, there's plus plus one until end of turn. <laughs> like, th this is better oh, on both man. sides. <laughs> Wait, what, what, it was the exact same cost. <laughs> what, what color was it? Was it three and a white? It was three and a white. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely 100% built a Felidar Retreat and Scoot Swarm put a billion land out deck because I mean the fact that you can plus one plus one helps deal with resiliency against a huge number of potential sweepers it just feels ah oh, so good now do you imagine this as being a build around like you know because I, I literally looked up landfall I looked up put land onto the battlefield <laughs> built the deck and then went I'll figure out interaction later or is this something that you would run in like an Azorius control list that doesn't have a lot of ramp, but you just are trying to get the incidental value out of? How? Do, what are some ways in which you might want to try to assemble a deck out of Felidar Retreat? So one of the really cool things about Felidar Retreat is that it is very flexible. Like when we looked at the Seagate Stormcaller, if if you've got Seagate Stormcaller in a deck, you mean it, right? You, you you're playing like twenty other cards to make that card work. It, you don't just toss them in. I think you could put Felidar Retreat into basically any white deck and be pretty happy with the results. I, I can see you playing this as a finisher in your Azorius control deck. I could see playing this in like a Bant landfall strategy that really maximizes this card. Right. I could see sideboarding this in the sideboard of like red, white aggro because imagine your opponent has a bunch of Wraths, sweeper effects. If you go creature on turn two, creature on turn three, Felidar Retreat on turn four, you don't care if they wrath. They kill your two creatures. Then next turn you re reset the whole board with with Felidar Retreat cats, and you, you can end up using this card in just about any deck that is playing white. And that's why I'm pretty high on the card. So, are there specific counters, responses, types of cards that you think will wind up showing up as a result in other decks to deal with a card like Felidar Retreat? Because I mean, what you mentioned that enchantments are generally not the most interactable. I mean, now black is getting some more ways to pick off enchantments, but I mean, what are your thoughts on how this might actually deform people's sideboarding plans? Yeah, if there's a lot of powerful enchantments, then people are gonna be are gonna respond to that. They're gonna they're gonna play more ways to kill them, and there's also, you know, a, a good way to kind of deal with fellow retreat that doesn't involve killing it is like if you're if if your control opponents are playing this card, and a lot of your threats have flying or or something like questing beast, which I guess these can't block Custing Beast, but then they start putting counters on. So yeah, let's oh, let's yeah, stick yeah. with the flying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go that way. Yeah. Uh, so I think that the best way to deal with this is probably just enchantment removal because this is a hard card to beat in a fair game otherwise. But there are ways to go over the top. Like Embercleave does a decent job against Felidar Retreat. You know, if you if you yeah. land a big Embercleave instead. Well, let's look at the final card that you selected as a card to watch for in Standard. It is the whole class of the Pathways, and I will explain this one, and then you can obviously see how we will extend it. Timber <coughs> Crown Pathway enters the battlefield untapped and can add green. And then if you see in the far bottom left, you see how that's land, tap, add red, and you see a little symbol in the top left. On the flip side is the exact same text, except it's add red. So the dual lands that are leaving, like the shock in for two damage and you can do red or blue, now it's you play either the red or the blue side. And I have a number of questions of how to evaluate this one, but let's start with why, why did this sort of top off your list in, in relevance? <laughs> These are these are a cycle of dual lands that all that enter the battlefield on tap, don't cost you any life, and provide two different colors. Like historically, that has always seen a ton of play. And in fact, is format defining just knowing that you've got a bunch of lands that that help these two color pairs, and not every color pair gets them. By the way, it, so yeah. you know the the ones that oh, don't are going to feel right? that. Hold on. Yeah, I'm it's not. There's not. There's not ten of these. All right. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We're going to sort filter not collected because I want to list all these out pathway. Okay. So there is a Demir one. There is an Orzov one. There is a okay. Let me. There is a black 
white one, there is a blue black one, there is a red blue, a green red, a green white, and a red white. There's actually yeah. six. Yeah, and then we're getting four in the next set. Huh. So three allied, three enemy, uh, and so you know, I, I don't think anyone, you know, I, I don't think anyone's gonna going to be surprised when they show up in the next set. I think that's basically obvious, but yeah, yeah it's going to, it's going to define a little bit of what color pairs are good or even what three color combinations are good. Like you said, it used to be that you're like, well, I'm going to play, you know, teamer, red, blue, green. I'm going to play four stomping grounds, four breeding pools and four yeah, steam yeah. vents and then <laughs> good go from there. But now it's like, oh, this two color combination doesn't have, like there's, there's no black green, I don't think. Right. So you, you end up, I really want to play the new Nissa, but oh wow, there's no black green land. Let me see how am I going to work this out? Or yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. this three color pair only gets one of these lands among the three pairs. Well, that's going to be rough. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is I think going to take me quite a lot of time to just get comfortable with because I've ne I've never played one of these. Pick this or pick that one. I just <laughs> dual tap. That's all well, I deal with. <laughs> well, that's the thing too is like imagine you have an opening hand of like Timber Crown Pathway, a mountain. And, or rather, yeah, Timbercrown Pathway, like a mountain, and then a mix of red and green cards, but one of them is a double red card. If you play this as a green land, you, you're, you're kind of locked out of casting that double red card right. until you draw another another red sword. It, 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 is, it, it pays you off for kind of uh, planning ahead well. It also does kind of pay you off for not having really color intensive cards. When if you have three, if you drew three copies of this card, you're only going to have two, like two red and one green, or two green and one red most of the time. Yeah. Whereas if you drew three stomping grounds, you'd have three red and three green. And a, a really notable aspect to all of these pathway cards is the fact that there is absolutely no land forest. It's not a plains. Like there's a whole lot of right. things like the castles you mentioned that you play a castle Arden Vale, it comes and tap unless you control a plains. And a card like Hallowed Fountain is a white-blue card that is also a Plains. It is a Plains Island. So none of these have any of the... I don't know what the name for that is. The the, the basic yeah. land name slapped on there. Yeah. Talk to me about the significance yeah, and of it, that. It's mostly going to come come up with Castles, because Castles are a really powerful card, you know, the cycle from Eldraine, where yeah. if you don't get to use Castles in your colors, you're really giving up a lot, because they, they, they do a lot of powerful things. But you might you might end up in a in a spot where you're like, well, I need to play eight pathways in this deck. I just can't afford to play castles alongside them. Well, awesome. With that, we have reviewed the best, indisputably awesome cards in yeah. standard. <laughs> we, we, we can't be wrong. I mean, have you even no, gotten to play not. in the pre-release yet? No, no. I, I had to spend most of my morning uh, on a Discord call with an extremely unpleasant individual. So. I know. I, that must have been a real horror. I really hope that none of the tech issues that showed up there show up later in the broadcast as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I have only gotten to play just a teensy tiny amount, so I'm really excited for what we're going to do next. We are going to be playing some standard deck brews that uh, Luis Scott Vargas provided to us. I'm going to be piloting them, and Louise is going to be giving commentary thoughts and sighing heavily at the skillful <laughs> play that I will be uh, providing. So we're going to step away to a brief break just to set that up because a full morning of tech was not enough. We still need another two minutes, so we're not even going to mute. Just stay here. <laughs> 